Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Just ask someone who's running a marathon. Ask them about the first time they did a marathon or somebody who's done a triathlon where they're going to swim and then they're going to ride and then they're going to run. You ask someone who's done an endurance race of any sort, was there a point along the way where you were ready to quit? And they will tell you their story. The technical term is, is, is when you bonk, when your body starts to shut down, when your muscles start to cramp up, when your body says, that's it, you're done, no more. And then you decide, are you going to press through? Do you have what it takes to press through, or are you going to quit? But anybody who's done an endurance race, especially for the first time, knows that feeling of hitting that wall where they're ready to quit. If you've been in a long-term friendship, even with the most wonderful of people, you know that there's a moment along the way where you realize she's not perfect. He's not perfect. This friend of yours who loves you, who may, maybe who loves Jesus, who's trying to be a good friend, there's a point where you recognize that they are imperfect, that they make mistakes, that they might have broken your trust or said something unfair or unkind. And at that moment you decide, will this relationship go on? Or are you going to cut it off and say, done, I'm out of here? Those are just the moments in life where you recognize that, that, man, this road is hard, and I I might be ready to give up. It's even true in your relationship with a local church. I've talked with many people through the years who they themselves or someone they love was part of a church. They were engaged. They were serving. They were growing. They were they were investing financially through their time, through their prayers, through serving. I mean, they were part of the life of the church, and all of a sudden, boom! It came to an end, and they gave up on it. And usually, that happened when they realized that the people in the church are imperfect. The people in the church are broken. Every one of them, including the pastors and the church elders and deacons and leaders. And there's a point along the way in so many parts of life where people just kind of hit the place where they're like pushing against the wall. It's getting difficult. It's getting even harder. And they kind of look and say, it'd be easier to just quit the race, end the relationship, leave the church, you fill in the blank. Well, that's where the people were at in the first century who received the book of Hebrews. They were at a point where they were were up against the wall. This book was written to people in a time of incredible struggle and pain. These people had, had in many cases, left their faith, their Jewish heritage, in many cases, their family members and their friends to follow Jesus. And there was that initial joy and wonder at the grace and the love and the presence of Jesus. And that grace and love and presence never changed, but along with it came the promise that Jesus gave that to follow him is to take up your cross, to deny yourself. It's not always easy. And in the first century, these these early Christians, many of them in these small home churches, are dealing with financial challenges and relational challenges and political strain and struggle. And they're hitting that point where they're going to kind of spiritually bonk. Their bodies are going to shut down. They're going to just be done. And many of them are saying, you know, do I want to keep following Jesus? It's so hard. It's demanding so much of me. Maybe I'll go back to my old way of living and my old way of thinking. It was a time of incredible struggle and pain. They were thinking about giving up. And and in that moment, what they needed was this renewed, refreshed vision of Jesus. To see Jesus as he is at all times. To remember his goodness and his glory and his beauty and his power. They needed a fresh vision of Jesus so that they could stand strong 
and press through. And when you read the book of Hebrews, there's different points where the writer talks about hang in there, stand strong, press through. It's worth it. Holding on to Jesus is worth it. And can I say today, if that sounds very contemporary, if you say, man, that sounds like my journey. I'm hitting a wall. I'm weary. I'm tired. Life's getting tough. And, and, and I'm, and I'm kind of getting ready to give up on maybe not Jesus, but the whole Jesus thing and being part of the body and the church and online services or whatever it is where you're just kind of getting weary and tired. Don't give up on Jesus. Don't give up on his family. Don't give up on his call on your life. I have talked with many of you who are part of Shoreline who have told me, I'm kind of there. It's tough. And yet you keep hanging on to Jesus. And the book of Hebrews gives us this vision that shows us it's absolutely, ultimately, completely worth it to hold on to Jesus, whatever we go through. In today's message, we're going to get a vision of Jesus as our great high priest. Jesus Christ is our great high priest. And I'll talk in a moment about, about what the high priest is and what he does and the difference it makes in our lives. But in the Bible, you have two different terms. Uh, one is prophet and one is priest. A prophet and a priest. And what we find out as we read the scriptures is that Jesus is perfectly both of those. He is both our prophet and our priest. A prophet, think about it, in the Bible times, a prophet was one who spoke for God. God had a message and God wanted to bring that message to the world. And so God spoke through a prophet to bring his message to the world. And there's no one that God spoke more through because he was God himself than Jesus Christ. The perfect revelation of the Father. We, we looked last week at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, where we read the words, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. He is the exact representation of God's being. Jesus is the perfect prophetic voice bringing the truth of God to people because he is the truth of God. So Jesus is a prophet declaring to us the truth. So a prophet is one who speaks on behalf of God to people. A priest is somebody who comes on behalf of people and calls out to God and speaks to God and brings a message to God from the people. And so Jesus is both our prophet, bringing the message of God to us as God himself speaking to us, and he is our perfect priest, bringing our prayers, our supplications, our needs to God the Father. Now, to say a prophet and priest are defined that way exclusively is not the point. It's bigger than that. There's more than that. But a simple understanding is a prophet speaks on behalf of God to us, and a priest will speak on our behalf to God. And Jesus does both of those things. He's the perfect connection because he is God with us. And so I want to think together about what this means and what it means to understand that Jesus Christ is our great high priest. If you grew up in a, in a more liturgical church, if you grew up in a Catholic church or a church that had priests, you probably have more of a sense of this. This idea that, that a priest sort of comes on your behalf to God. Some of you might remember going into a quiet little room and saying, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. And they asked, how long has it been since your last confession? And you told them how long. And then you would kind of tell your different sins. And you, you, you would confess your sins. And then that priest, on your behalf, the idea, the concept was, would bring your concerns to God. And then they would tell you God's desire for you, that you would do uh, so many rosaries or so many Hail Marys or whatever it was to kind of have penance for that. Some of you are going, that was my childhood. That was my adulthood. Some of you say that's still part of my journey, but, but that, that you understand that idea that, that, that a priest sort of stands between God and people, but the, what the Bible teaches us, and here's the beauty of it, and you gotta get this. Jesus Christ is your great high priest. He left the glory of heaven. He came as one of us. He died on the cross for our sins in our place. He took our shame. He took our pain. He took our judgment. And three days after his death, he rose again in glory. He ascended to the right hand of the Father and he intercedes for us. Here's the point. We don't have to ever go to another human being again to get to the Father. We come through Jesus Christ who is our great high priest. And when we understand what Jesus did and how he intercedes for us and how, and how he, he brings our hearts before the Father, our whole lives begin to change. 
I want to think together about what it means to declare that Jesus Christ is our great high priest. And with each of these truths comes a passage from the book of Hebrews. So have your Bible open and ready and have your heart open to hear what God wants to say to you. So first, because our high priest did the work, because Jesus Christ did the work on the cross, because our high priest did the work, we can rest. If you know that Jesus Christ is your great high priest, that he intercedes for you, that that he's paid the price for your sins, and and that all of the justice for your sins has been satisfied in Jesus, and you can come before the Father with joy and with confidence, cleansed because of Jesus, then you can actually do this. It's okay. There's a place for rest in your life. As a matter of fact, God is clear that he wants to bring you his rest, a rhythm of rest in your life, an overall rest because of what Jesus has done, but a weekly rhythm of rest. And so, because Jesus is our high priest and he did the work, we can rest. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. Hebrews 4, 9 through 11. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did for him, from his. Let us therefore make every effort, every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. It's pointing back to people in the Old Testament days who would not rest. When you know that Jesus is your great high priest, when you know that he's paid the price for your sins to the Father, and you're washed clean. You can know that you have eternal hope of rest in heaven forever with God, but even in the flow of this life, you can get a rhythm of Sabbath. One of the Ten Commandments is that we would rest. I mean, think about it. Some of the Ten Commandments, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal. And then there's this one. And by the way, get some rest. Take a nap. Relax. Take a deep breath. One of the Ten Commandments, one of the things God wants for you and wants for me is that we would learn to Sabbath well, to rest well. That's been one of my greatest challenges as a Christian for many, many years as a young Christian. I just, it was work, 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 work. And and it wasn't that I was trying to prove to God I was good enough. I knew I wasn't. I knew the grace of Jesus. But I had a hard time just kind of stepping back and resting. And so here we're reminded that there's a, there's a Sabbath rest for God's people. If you're one of God's people, if you receive Jesus Christ, God says, I have rest for you. Not just at the end of time, but in the flow of your normal week. Every follower of Jesus, every seven days, should slow down and rest. If you can do it for 24 hours, wonderful. If you can do it for a shorter time, you do what you can. When, when, when Sherry and I were newly married and, and, and we... we we had a couple years without kids. Man, we, had, we took a full day for Sabbath rest. It was wonderful. When our kids were five, three, and one, a little more challenging. We couldn't say to them, hey, it's our day of rest. Stop fussing. Wait here. We'll be home in 24 hours. Not an option. So actually, at one point, I got started to get a rhythm of every, every week having a day of rest, and that was wonderful. And then my wife said to me, very kindly but firmly, um, could I have a day of rest too? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, good point. So we actually took one day of the week. We took Friday. Sundays I worked. I was a pastor. But on Friday, I would take a third of the day for myself. She would have a third of the day for herself, and I'd take care of the kids, and we'd have the rest of the day together. But we each had a chunk of that day as a rhythm of rest. It's important that we figure this out. So here's a question for you. What keeps you from fully receiving the peace, the calm, and the rest of Jesus? whether it's a rhythm of Sabbath or whether it's just being able to at the end of a day say, you know what? That's enough for the day. I've worked hard. I've tried to honor Jesus, provide for my family, but I can actually take a deep breath and rest. What gets in the way of that? And I think one aspect of the, one big problem is this. I call it just wrong theology. It's theology that says, you know what? Ultimately, I don't deserve it. I don't deserve to rest. I, I'm, I'm imperfect, I'm sinful, I make bad choices. I've got to always be kind of working to show God I'm worthy. That's bad theology. The Bible says that while we were sinners, Jesus died for us. The Bible says none is worthy, no, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
God knows your sin. He knows my sin. He knows our past. He knows our present. He knows our future. And he says, I've made you to work hard, but I have made you to rest. So get your theology right. Resting isn't saying, I've done everything right or everything's done. It's saying, God's on the throne. He rules the universe. And he calls me to learn a rhythm of rest that's so important for me and so important for my family, if you have a family. If you, if you are a workaholic that can't stop working and you can't make the time to be with your kids and slow down and play with your kids, look at that and say, God, teach me the rhythm of rest. Here's the challenge. Establish a rhythm of Sabbath, a rhythm of rest. In the flow of a normal day, little moments of rest, but every week, sometime where you know you can dial down, cool your jets, shut off the motor, take a deep breath. And here's what I learned when I really started walking in. It's probably... 20 years ago. I'd been a Christian for 15 years before I really started understanding the gift and the glory of rest. But, but the, the beautiful thing is, I, and I started to understand that here's the thing. If I stop working, put some things on the back burner, when I come back to work 24 hours later, they'll still be there. The problems are still there. The issues are still there. It's not like they're going to disappear. So no one else is going to probably take care of them. But it's like, well, I got to do with it now. No, you know what? I can do with it now or in 24 hours. It'll still be there in 24 hours. So take that time for rest. And it will bless your soul. It will bless your family. It will bless your friends. And most of all, it will bless the heart of the God who said, I made you to work hard and I made you to rest. Our great high priest invites us to rest. The great high priest is shockingly approachable. The great high priest, Jesus Christ, our priest of all priests, our high priest, is shockingly approachable. We can draw near to him. Listen to these words in Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest, one who ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. And here's the difference. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. There is a place of mercy and there is a place of grace and there's the throne of God. And we are told to approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Why why could we, people like us, imperfect people, why could we just walk into God's presence? And we live in a, we live in a world where there's places we're not invited to. There, there, there's invitations we don't get. There's people that are very unapproachable. And yet the God of heaven says, come on in. Draw near me. That should blow our minds and warm our hearts. The God who made us, the maker of heaven and earth, he says, approach my throne of grace with confidence. And you're going to find mercy. You're going to find grace there. So come on in. Man, what a gift that is. Why can we come to the very throne room of God the Father with confidence? Because Jesus Christ, our great high priest, has opened the door. He's paid the price. His sacrifice on the cross makes that approach possible. Why? Because the Father looks at us, and because of the work of Jesus, God the Father sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Our sin was placed on Jesus and taken away. His righteousness was placed on ours, on our hearts and on our lives. So when we knock on the door, when we approach God, he says, come on in. Why? He sees the righteousness of Jesus in you and on you if you put your faith in Jesus. That is is amazing. That is glorious. That's our great high priest at work. So here's the question. What will help you approach Jesus with greater boldness? What will help you say, you know, I, you know, I know I can come near to God, but can I, just, can I just rush into God's presence? I've had people through the years come to me and say, Pastor, would you pray about this? Or Pastor, would you pray about that? And, and sometimes they're coming to me, I know they're asking me to pray, not just because they want me to pray with them, but they sort of feel like my prayers have special power. Like I have this special approach, you know, I'm, I'm a pastor, I'm ordained, I've got reverend in front of my name, whatever, in their mind, it's like, oh, I've had theological seminary training, so maybe I have a special access to God. Wrong. I do not have any special access to God that you don't have if you're a Christian. Because my access comes through Jesus Christ, the great high priest who paid the price. 
So how do we get in this place where we feel comfortable drawing near to God? And here's my best thing I can tell you. Practice. Just practice. Like anything that you want to get good at. Every day, enter into God's presence. Every day. Open this book and read and learn from God Almighty who breathed this word by his spirit for you. Talk to God every day. Just just come near him. Practice just talking to him. Listen for God. Ask God, speak to my heart. Guide my life. Sing songs of praise to the God who made you. Sit quietly in his presence. And just, just think about, Jesus, I love you. Oh, how I love you. I draw near to you, Father, through Jesus Christ who gave his life. God, how I love you. Invite Jesus to be near you in every part of your life. If you want to draw near to God consistently, ask God to be part of your life. What what part of my life? Everything. Everything. I remember as a young Christian, uh, a number of my friends who were not Christians, when I told them I wouldn't keep doing the stuff I used to do before I was a Christian, didn't want to hang out with me anymore. So I had a season when I didn't have a lot of friends. uh, Just because I wouldn't, most of the friends I hung out with were doing things that were either illegal, immoral, or both. And I wouldn't do those things. And so they kind of cut me off. And I was really into skateboarding at the time. So I'd go out skateboarding by myself. But you know what I started doing? This is, I mean, I'm 15 years old at the time, okay? So give me a little grace. But I would just say, Jesus, do you want to go skateboarding? And he always said yes. And I would go skateboarding with the maker of the universe. I'm, I'm thinking about it, remembering it right now. How I was alone, but I was never alone. Draw near to God. Practice. Talk to him. Be in his right. And just ask him to be part of your life. And you're going to discover that anytime you draw near to God, his arms are open. And anytime you ask him to come along with you, even if it's skateboarding, he's always going to say yes. Because we draw near to him with confidence because our great high priest has opened the way. That's good news. That's the work of Jesus, our great high priest. What else do we learn from Hebrews That Jesus, our great high priest, is radically different than any human priest. We have to understand that that in the ancient world, in this time, there were high priests who worked in the temple. There were high priests before they worked in the tabernacle and the temple through the Old Testament. They gave sacrifices. They did the work of the priesthood. And so we have to understand that, that the human high priest and Jesus, the great final high priest, who is better than all other priests that came before him, that, that he's radically different. You'll notice it here in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. In Hebrews 5, 1 through 3, we read these words. Every high priest is selected from among the people. This is not Jesus. This is all the high priests. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God. Remember, priests go communicate from people to God. So they were appointed to represent the people in matters related to God to offer gifts and the sacrifices for sins. And he, the the high priest, the human high priest, he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and who are going astray. Why? Since he himself is subject to weaknesses. This is why he has to offer, this is key, this is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as the sins of the people. The human high priests had to come and offer sacrifices for their own sins And they had to have our sacrifices for the sins of the people. But Jesus, the great final high priest, and we'll look at this more later, but a little preview, he offered one sacrifice, not for himself, for his sins, because he didn't sin. Jesus didn't offer a sacrifice for himself. He offered a sacrifice of himself. He laid his own life down and paid the price completely for sins and washed our sins away. That's amazing. There's a difference. The human priests and the human high priest offered sacrifices for the people and their own sins. But Jesus offered sacrifices for the people of himself as the sacrifice for sins. So just a question for reflection. How can we stand in awe of this glorious high priest who loves us? If Jesus offered himself, if he's completely different in that that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he is the high priest and he is the sacrifice himself. It's amazing. How do we stand in awe of this glorious high priest who loves us? I think we think about how we relate to Jesus as our high priest. A friend friend told me a story 
about uh, having lunch with another pastor friend. And that pastor friend, this was years ago, and that pastor friend said, you know, I'm actually having dinner tonight with Billy Graham. I'm scheduled to have dinner with Billy Graham. And along the way, he said, would you like to come with me? And this friend of mine said, I got this invitation. And he said, I was actually supposed to get on a plane and fly somewhere else. But I'm like, I'm going to cancel the flight. I don't care what else I have. I would love to meet Billy Graham face to face. Now, plans changed. He never got to go. He didn't get to meet Billy Graham. He didn't get to have dinner with him. But what went through his mind is right now, I'll cancel everything I have. I'll cancel my flight. I'll tell other people, I'm, I'm gonna, I have a chance to meet this amazing person. Well, the God we worship, Jesus Christ, our great high priest, I gotta tell you, you know, we learned last week he's better than the angels. I'm gonna tell you right now, he's better than Billy Graham. Billy Graham would tell you, I bow my knees before Jesus. And so we understand that our great high priest invites us to come near to him. We've got to express our celebration of who he is. So let me tell you three ways you can express your praise for Jesus Christ, your great high priest. Tell him. Tell him you love him. Tell him he's glorious. Tell him you're thankful for the price he paid. Tell Jesus, I thank you that you're my great high priest. Have you ever started a prayer this way? Dear Jesus, my great high priest. And tell him that he's, you know he's the one who's interceded for you and even now intercedes for you. Tell him. And then tell others about him. I have this Jesus in my life. He saved me. He paid the price for me. He's my great high priest. Tell other people, and then tell ourselves. Just just say to yourself, man, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful I have Jesus. Tell him, tell others, but tell yourself, I have it so good. What, there's, there's a great old hymn, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and grieves to bear. What a friend. Jesus, I celebrate who you are. He is your great high priest. Is it starting to sink in? Are you getting the picture? Well, it goes on. Our high priest calls us to grow up in faith. He calls us to mature. He doesn't want us to stay the same. He wants us to go deeper. In Hebrews 5, 12, and 13, we read these words. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you The elementary truths of God's word all over again. You've got to learn the basics again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, being a baby, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. I heard a preacher one time preach a sermon on this text, and I'm not sure what his goal was. He taught the sermon from a uh, a giant high chair wearing a giant bib. And I think it was sort of insulting his congregation. I don't think I would quite go that far with uh, props in a sermon. But he was talking about how, you know, he was saying, you know, I'm a little baby and I want it my way, my way. And he was kind of, and, and so he, but he, this pastor literally had a giant, a giant high chair made and he sat in it with a bib and kind of told the congregation they needed to grow up. Um, I think God has a little bit more gentleness with us in how he comes at us. But what's being said here is he's saying, listen, you ought to be mature right now but you need to grow up. You're not where you need to be. And I believe that Jesus Christ, our great high priest, would say to you and would say to me as a pastor, man, there's still growth that needs to happen. You still gotta learn to, 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 to chew on the meat of God's word and to go deeper in faith. That's why at Shoreline, we, we have a, 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 a kind of a personal spiritual growth assessment on our website. If you've never done it, I'd encourage you to go to our website and, and just look at, look at and we've got an assessment for adults and we've got an assessment for youth. And when you, fill, when you answer all the questions, you'll immediately get back in your email where you're strongest and where you need to grow and some ideas for spiritual growth. If you decide you want to do that, and so the question for you, what's your next step in spiritual maturity? I mean, what's your next step? Here's my challenge to you. I challenge you to take the, the self-assessment of spiritual growth and look at these seven kind of spiritual markers of growth, these seven growth markers of, uh, for our lives as followers of Jesus and, and say, where do I need to grow? And take steps. We can choose to grow up in faith so that our great high priest can look and say that he celebrates our maturity and our spiritual growth. Our high priest offered the final, perfect, and ultimate sacrifice. So, it should change everything. It should change everything. Look with me at Hebrews 10, 11 through 14. In Hebrews 10, 11 through 14, we read these words. Day after day, Every priest, this is human priest, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. 
Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices. You can almost feel the futility of it. The same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. They remind you of sin. They don't take away sin. But listen to this, verse 12. But when this priest, our great high priest, when this priest had offered for all time the one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. For by one sacrifice, his sacrifice on the cross, for by one sacrifice, he has made perfect, that's you and me if we come to him by faith, forever those who are being made holy. Wow. Mind-blowing. Heart-wrenching that Jesus would pay that price for us and open a way for us. But that's exactly what Jesus did. So what can we do to add to the sacrifice of Jesus? What can, what can you do or I do to add to his sacrifice? Here's the answer, and I hope you know the answer before I say it. Nothing. We can add nothing to the sacrifice of Jesus. It is final, it's complete, it's forever, it's done. No more sacrifices are needed. What we do is not something to add to it, we respond to it. And we respond by saying, thank you. Lord, transform my life. And so as we end each of the sermons in this series, we're going to just quickly look at four different ways that we can respond. When we know that Jesus is our high, high priest, it should change everything about us. So here's the first thing. Because Jesus is our great high priest, we worship with unrestrained passion. When you gather for worship with God's people or when you're alone, you come before God and say, Jesus, you are my high priest. You've opened the way to the Father. I'm ready to worship. Come with passion. Come prepared. Before you log on online for next week's service or if you come and join us in the courtyard, before you show up here, come before God and say, God, prepare my heart. I want to worship Jesus, my great high priest, and bring your passion. Second, because Jesus is our great high priest, we surrender to his will over our desires. God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will, not mine. And so, and so we submit ourselves to the will of Jesus. As you read the scriptures, as you learn from the heart of the Spirit, and God leads you, surrender to his will again and again and again. And then, because Jesus is our great high priest, we confidently follow his Spirit's leading in the flow of every day. As we walk through the day, as we move through life, Lord, what's your will? Lord, as I, as I walk into the workplace, what's your will for me? As I, as I go online for a meeting, right before, Lord, what's your will for me? How should, is there a direction you want to give me? And when you sense the Spirit leading, when you sense the Scriptures guiding you, respond to it and just follow his will and follow his will. Well, in what situation? In every situation. How do I follow his will? You know the word, you respond to the spirit, and when God is challenging you, you, you accept the challenge, and then you watch what he does in you and through you. And then fourth and finally, because Jesus is our great high priest, we let the people know, or we let the people we love know that God came near and is ready to meet their needs. When you've met this high priest, when you realize that he has washed you clean, he's given you new life, he lives inside of you, that you have access to the Father, you want other people to know that the, that the work of Jesus Christ, the great high priest, is not just for you, and it's not just for me, it's not just for people in the church, it's for everyone who will receive. The most stubborn people, the most resistant to Jesus. I have friends right now that are Christians, and some that are leaders in churches, and some that are pastors. They were so resistant to God, you can't even believe it. My little brother, who was, who was kind of an intellectual atheist, who got upset at his workplace because they referred to a Christmas tree, and he asked them to call it a holiday shrub because he was offended by the name of Christ. My little brother, who's now a worship leader and is raising his six kids to love Jesus, changed. So you don't keep it to yourself when you've met this high priest who, who stands offering himself for the payment of your sins. You want other people to know that he's ready to be that close to them too and they can now draw near with confidence through Jesus Christ. Jesus, this is our prayer today. 
that as we close this time of studying your word, our learning doesn't end. It just begins. Jesus, you are our great high priest. You have made a way to the Father. We can come in confidence and in joy. And so we pray, oh Jesus, that you will fill us with your spirit, that you will lead us in your ways, and that we will sense you with us, interceding, guiding, protecting, and with us at all times, that we will approach the throne of grace with confidence because you've opened the way. Jesus, we give you praise. We thank you for this truth that you are our great high priest. Let us walk in that truth this week, we pray in your name. Amen. Well, before I send you off with a word of blessing, I want to share some very important details that I think each of these details, one is going to touch you. So just uh, tune in for what fits for you. First of all, if you want prayer, if you've had a struggle, a challenge in your life, or somebody you love is going through a tough time, or maybe there's something wonderful that's happening and you want someone to hear with joy what you're going through and praise the Lord with you, uh, please simply call or email the church and we want to partner with you in prayer. If you're new to Shoreline, or maybe you've never connected with us, would you text the word welcome? And we want to respond back and just get to know you and try to make a real personal connection and welcome with you, and we will follow up with you. If you have questions about Shoreline, if you want, if you want more information about any ministry in the church, then email us. And when you email, be very specific, and we will give you specific responses as quick as we can to get back to you and help you kind of move forward in your connection with Jesus and with Shoreline Church. And also I want to say, if you have children, uh, from fifth grade and younger. We have some great things going on online for children. I want to encourage you to go to the front of our website and the family resources. If you'll click on that, you'll find some opportunities for children, you know, age-specific opportunities that include a lesson, some activities, even a song to sing. I encourage you not just to go to that, but to go to that with your kids, watch it with your kids and talk about it and walk with them on their journey of spiritual growth because your kids... For them, if they're coming to know Jesus, he is their great high priest. What better way to help them understand that truth than to walk with them and learn together with your kids? Now as we finish this time together, may you go into this new week deeply and profoundly aware that Jesus Christ, through faith in his name, is the great high priest. Walk in his name. Be present with God the Father and come near him with confidence. Celebrate Jesus as your great high priest. And if you have an opportunity, let somebody else know that he loves them too. God bless you and have a great week.